Welcome to the 2024 GPAC NAIA baseball training video. Those umpires who were not able to make it live in person at Northwestern College or in Omaha, Nebraska, and coaches, players, fans of the GPAC conference, NAI baseball. This is what was shared with all of our umpires. And our goal is to get all parties involved and invested and stakeholders, not only in the GPAC conference, but NAIA baseball, the same information of the expectations of our baseball umpire staff. For NAIA registration, varsity umpires must register at ref, refquest.com. Um, there is a registration fee involved. Um, there are NAIA training videos. There are NCAA training videos that will be watched throughout the season. And then there's a 25-question NAIA test. We'll go over some of the specific NAIA rules that are on the test um, in this presentation. But not anybody could just show up to the ball field and umpire. There are a lot of requirements off the field preparation, education, before umpires are allowed the opportunity to work varsity games. Umpires who are looking to aspire a varsity assignment or a full-time staff placement, once again, we encourage them to register with NAIA through RefQuest. Number one, the education process. Number two, when we are short-staffed because of weather and the days and times the games are being played, if they are registered, we can more likely use them on varsity games. And then when registering with NAIA, they're sent rule books, case books, mechanic manuals, and they have access to the updated bulletins, points of emphasis, rule interpretations. So when they go out and work college baseball, they have the most up-to-date information to share with the coaches and players that they are umpiring for. So our standards, uh, number one, this is a QR code for timeout with PSOA. If you're watching this video, more than likely you are at our YouTube channel. We're asking all GPAC umpires to subscribe to the channel because throughout the year, we are going to be putting up plays, not only from the GPAC conference, but NCAA and other NAIA games of correct rulings, correct interpretations, proper mechanics and signals, and how to handle situations. For our staff, our pregame and postgame expectations, register through RefQuest, no tobacco on school grounds, proper, clean, professional uniform, business casual dress to games. We tell umpires when they arrive on a game site, they are watched from the moment they get out of the car until the moment they get back into the car. And when we take the job professionally, before the game, during the game, after the game, it only benefits not only those umpires, but our whole entire staff of umpires as a reflection of our professionalism. Umpires, remember, social media could be used as a positive and, and a negative. Stay away from any negative social media post about any sports officials. Not just basketball, not just baseball or football, any. If there is something positive to share through social media, that's how we want to use it to promote sports officials. If we are contacted for media questions, we're asking all umpires, contact the commissioner, Corey Westra, or myself, Sean Johnston, and we will take it from there. All the above that I just talked about can lead to dismissal from staff. I'll be checking NAI registration March 1st to make sure all umpires are registered. At that point, if you're not, um, we're at risk of having to take you off of those varsity contests. Game expectations. Pre-game with your partner. 
thing about being a sports official, we have family life. We have work life. When we pregame and talk baseball, we are getting our mindset into that baseball umpiring mindset. Even if it's with a partner you've been working with for 10 years, talk about runner's lane interference. Talk about who has the upper half, lower half on box. Talk about who's got overthrown baseball. Even though we know it, we're getting our mindset into baseball. Plate meeting five minutes prior to the first pitch. Um, coaches, we were very good last year. One o'clock start time, watering down the fields, chalking the fields, and the field was ready to go at 12.50 for first pitch at one o'clock. Please continue to adhere to those pregame guidelines of when home team, visiting team, batting practice, home team, visiting team, in and outs, and allowing the home team enough time to get that field ready so the umpires could take the field five minutes prior, do the plate meeting, and we play baseball. Um, we know the importance of this when it comes to routines of warming up the pitchers. If we are working on the field and we're 10 minutes late, that's 10 minute difference of that pitching routine of what they do to warm up. So let's adhere to the GPAC guidelines. Umpires, when applicable, please communicate to myself if a game was delayed, not because of weather, but because the pregame protocol was not followed correctly. At the plate meeting, get the home team lineup card first, visiting team second, confirm are they going nine player lineup with a pitcher DH, or a 10-player lineup with the DH hitting for the pitcher. Have the home coach go over the ground rules. Very important, confirm with head coaches, all players legally equipped. Coaches, reminder, pine tar cannot be above the 18-inch mark on the bat. Bats must have that series, that doubleheader sticker with the GPAC color with that doubleheader in series. And cracked helmets or taped helmets are not legal equipment. Right? Even if it's the same color on the helmet, black helmet, black tape, not legal. If you have cracked helmets, do not bring them into the dugout. Do not bring them to the game. You're at risk of the umpire stopping the game, removing that helmet, and bringing up a new helmet. Um, so double check the equipment throughout the season. Umpires, if we see equipment that is uh, altered, defective, and not made when it was manufactured, please remove that equipment and have the player get equipment that is legal and safe. Coaches, we'll have a clip on this later, but if you have a question for the calling umpire, call time and go to the, your respective foul line and or outside the dirt circle. And then umpires, be a positive communicator. Listen to the coaches first. Understand what they're feeling. Understand what they saw from their angle. And then after the coach is asked a question, give them a professional response, in my judgment, then by rule. So the best example I could give, coach, in my judgment, on the force plate first base, the runner and ball got there at the same time. By rule, the runner did not beat the ball, therefore the runner is out on the force play. Um, so it's not me versus you, it's just this is what I saw. Based on what I saw, this is the rule that I have to apply in this situation. Uniforms, there was a couple questions. Um, you know, what hats are we wearing? Uh, most umpires have a CBUA hat. If partners don't have a CBUA hat, all black hat is acceptable. There are some GPAC hats still out there. If both have it, <coughs> you can have the GPAC hat. NAIA hat can be found on Honigs.com. And once again, I ask the umpires, match your partner's hat. Just like teams have multiple hats, we have multiple hats. Have all the hats you have bring with you and match your partner. Charcoal gray pants, black thermal jackets with white piping, black short sleeve shirt, 
Carolina Blue short sleeve is what most umpires have. Tell umpires, bring everything you have. That way, the more shirts you have with you, the more you can match your partners. Majority black shoes, black socks, black ball bags, black belts. Umpires, from a supervisor perspective, player perspective, fan perspective, coach perspective, a parent makes the umpire. There's many aspects that go into a parent's. Uniform is a big category. This is something we have control over. Take pride in it. Look great in uniform. GPAC accountability assignments. We're asking umpires. When changes are made or when you are given an opportunity to umpire because you show available in Arbiter Sports, please accept that assignment within 24 hours. Typically, I'll send the assignment, I'll text you, and then I'll give you a day to accept or decline it. I don't expect within five minutes. Um, we have balance of work, of family, of personal um, schedules, um, and I know umpires have to do some logistics. So 24 hours, I believe, is fair. Um, if you need more than 24 hours, just communicate that with me. If we can give you more than 24 hours, I will. Um, if I can't because of the time frame and I have another umpire available, I, I might give it to another umpire. Each week, take five minutes to update availability for the next week and do this every week. You know, perfect example is we have good weather Sunday, good weather Monday afternoon, cold weather Monday night. All right, so they're changing Monday nights to Monday afternoons. I'm not asking umpires to take off for work to stay on that game. But if you can't work the Monday afternoon game because you correctly have it blocked, I can now find the next umpire, the best available umpire for that game. Umpires, if you get a text message because you show open all day, hey, can you work Monday noon at Midland? Hopefully the answer is yes because you showed open. When it comes to accountability, that professionalism off the field, if we can't keep a calendar organized and updated, how could we keep a game organized and under control? Control what we can control. Um, quickly, five minutes updating Arbiter is a pretty easy task to ask for when it comes to college level umpiring. GPAC conference, there's going to be two sites of four teams, May 2nd through 5th. Um, the championship game is Tuesday championship game, May 7th, time and site TBA. The highest seed left um, will most lo likely host, uh, but if it's far spread apart, the teams can meet in the middle. Um, my goal this year is to try to get the same crew of three or four umpires at each site May 2nd through 5th and finding that three-person championship crew who worked um, at one of those two sites. So as we get the season going, I'll probably start reaching out to umpires who I, I feel who are qualified um, for the conference tournament to ask for availability. Uh, and no, I will give first opportunity to those umpires who are qualified and then can work uh, May 2nd through 5th. If we have a team that is hosting NAI playoffs that we assign for, um, we will assign that opening round May 13th through 16th. This is a Monday through Thursday. All right, so if you're part of the conference tournament, we're, we're assigning the opening round. I'm more than likely going to ask you to work the opening round. Again, if you're able to manage family and work schedule and you want to be available for these two tournaments, start doing your footwork now, communicating with family and bosses. Because once again, that opening round, we're trying to get a crew of five for that whole opening round, May 13th through 16th, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We did nominate three umpires for the World Series, um, which is a 10-day event. Uh, and, and that's a difficulty for umpires. Umpires always ask me, how do I get postseason? How do I get the World Series? And a lot of times it, it's the ability to manage your schedule to be off of work the whole month of May. It's a lot to ask for. 
that is what the NAIA is looking for. The consistency of NAIA umpires with the NAIA rule set and experience and postseason experience to be available for that month of May for those players and coaches. I say all the time, uh, the umpires are the third team. As players and coaches advance in the tournament, they're available for the whole tournament. And we try to have umpires that have that same mindset of I am the third team and I need to make myself available if that is a goal. Not saying you have to to work NAI baseball, but that's a huge part of being able to work the NAIA World Series is that availability for the month of May. Our rates this year, all GPAC schools pay via Arbiter Pay. A doubleheader is $270. A single nine-inning game is $185. The GPAC pay dates are the 15th of each month and the 1st of each month. We also assign for Bellevue and Dakota State. They have their own paperwork. Doubleheader 270, single game 160. Um, if you are new as an umpire, you will have to set up an Arbiter Pay account to get paid. So GPAC accountability. Coaches always ask, you know, why are these umpires selected? Umpires ask, why are those umpires selected and not me? So I, I'm going to try to be very transparent here and give myself as a supervisor accountability of what I look for from throughout the whole entire year. So number one, amount of NAIA games umpired, and I combine that with years of service as an NAIA umpire. I might have an umpire who works eight NAIA games this year, and it just so happens they also work five Division II weekends and four Division I weekends. But their years of service is 20. And early in their career, they did. They worked 30, 40 NAI games in a year. I take that into consideration, not just did they work 20, 30 games this year, but years of service, have they been around NAI baseball enough to understand the culture, to understand the rule changes? Um, so that's where I start. I, I get my pool of umpires based on my belief of how well versed they are in NAIA baseball. Next, I try to put umpires in a position for success. We can't have umpires learn three person or how to manage situations in a positive way. What umpires have that skill set to be positive communicators in tough situations? Our GPAC team players, and what we mean by team players, they're flexible. They're good crew chiefs. They assist umpires to get better. They support umpires on the field. They work with frustrated players to prevent escalation. They work with coaches who are frustrated to prevent ejections. You know, it, it's we are in it together for each other. It's not me versus you. That's a team player. It's the we before the me. And those umpires stand out really quick just having conversations with fellow umpires, with administrators, with coaches. Uh, so be the we before the me to be part of that consideration. Rules knowledge. All right. There are always going to be rule questions. There will be judgment situations. And it's a simple question from me to umpire, hey, why did you call it this way? And the judgment might be wrong on film, which is fine. That's why we have film to learn, timing, angles, distance. But connected, being able to connect your judgment to a rule is important. Being able to connect a judgment to a rule to a coach in the moment is important without stumbling words. It's being able to express a rule and apply a rule appropriately. Strike zone accuracy, NCAA standard. Um, one thing I love about NEI baseball in our conference, almost every single game at a home site is on film. So am I going to watch every single pitch, every single umpire throughout the season? Absolutely not. 
Will I watch? Have I watched? Inning here, inning there, half inning here, half inning there? Absolutely. And we are looking for what umpires consistently are doing and following the NCAA standard on strike zone, which we'll go, go into later in this training video. Game management. This is unsporting behavior. Nip it in, in the bud in the beginning before it escalates. Meeting the GPAC standards talked about in the previous slide. I do look for peer feedback, crew chief feedback, coaches feedback. I always ask coaches at the end of the season, what umpires did you have this year that you would like to see more next year? Would you like to see more in a postseason situation? So I, I don't use coaches feedback to decide who is eligible for postseason this year, 2024, but I will use coaches feedback that on umpires in 2024 for 2025 season, which then goes into continued education. What umpires are going to college clinics? What umpires are watching and answering questions on timeout with PSOA? What umpires are reading the bulletins that are sent out because we see it applied on the next week of, week of games? So umpires who continually educate themselves and they are preparing themselves when they get the opportunity to work postseason. That's what we're looking for. Availability is huge. Appearance, which you have total control over, is important. That's what makes the umpire. Communication throughout the season via arbiter, via uh, after post-game reports, um, and just overall communication confirming with schools. Changes. Changes coaches gave you, con communicating that to me. Um, Sometimes coaches contact the umpires first. Great. Make sure that communication is sent to myself and your crew together. Um, film will be used, and then sometimes it's just luck. Um, luck of change of game so you got more opportunities and you nailed three plays. All right, so, again, every single game matters, and you never know when somebody is watching. So go into every single game, every single inning, every single pitch, somebody is watching. NAIA rule modifications. So NAI baseball, we use NCAA rules with the exception of these three modifications. So modification number one, re-entry for eight starters. We say eight because the starting pitcher or starting pitcher slash designated hitter, they cannot re-enter. Uh, example from the test. Starting pitcher moves to shortstop. In the seventh inning, that starting pitcher that moved to shortstop was the, uh, pinch hit for. And now that coach wants to re-enter, in their mind, the shortstop. That player cannot re-enter because he was the starting pitcher pitcher so once the starting pitcher goes to a defensive position number one the designated hitter is removed number two that player even though in that position they leave the game they cannot re-enter because they were the starting pitcher so only eight starters catcher first base second base shortstop third base right field center field left field could re-enter. Next one, courtesy runners. Pitcher or for the catcher. Now, if the pitcher is hitting for themselves, they could courtesy run for that pitcher DH. If it's a 10-player lineup and that DH is hitting for another person who is pitching, they cannot courtesy runner for the DH, only for the player who is pitching and then the catcher cannot run, courtesy runners cannot run for the pinch hitter who hit for the catcher. The catcher must re-enter. And all the catcher has to do is step out of the dugout, wave to the umpire. The umpire will point. The catcher has re-entered. And then the courtesy runner can go on to the base in which the catcher would have been going to. But if the pinch hitter gets on base for the catcher, we can't courtesy run 
and a coach saying, well, he's going to be my catcher next inning. It doesn't work that way. The only person who is a catcher is a catcher who last caught the last half inning on defense. Courtesy runner cannot be removed from the bases to be a pinch hitter. Okay, A courtesy runner can score. A courtesy runner can be put out and in that same inning be a pinch hitter. But a runner at second base who's a courtesy runner, a coach can't come out and say, we're going to change courtesy runners because the one who's on second base is going to be on deck. They can't do that. The coach has to wait for that courtesy runner to score or be put out before they hit in that inning as a pinch hitter. Courtesy runners must be eligible substitute and not had played in the game previously. Minus, nope, I won't even get into that situation. But eligible substitute, right? They have not played in the game previously. And the courtesy runner can run both for the pitcher, the pitcher DH, or the catcher if it's a different inning. If it's the same inning, they can only courtesy for one of those positions. But if it's different innings, so the first inning, they courtesy run for the pitcher DH. The second inning, they courtesy run for the catcher. It could be the same courtesy runner, but not in the same inning. Ejections, the rule modification here is all participants have to serve a minimum of one game suspension. Head coaches in NAI baseball must serve a one game suspension. So if it, a head coach is ejected in the first game of a doubleheader, we haven't had time to file the report. NAI hasn't sent anything to the athletic directors. You as an umpire got to remind the coach if they are out to start that second game, we can't start that second game until that coach is out of sight and sound. They must serve a one-game suspension in NAIA baseball. There were no rule changes this year for NCAA baseball. There were interpretations, and then there were points of emphasis. <coughs> The first interpretation is the illegal bat. The main one that we saw last year was stickers falling off, especially later in the season, because the bats have 10, 20 stickers on them throughout the year. Okay, so before the game, they do the barrel bat test protocol. Umpires are not involved in that at all. A bat is given a sticker. If that sticker falls off, and the defense appeals that it altered bat, the sticker fell off, the batter is out, and the bat is removed from the game. I, I can't emphasize this enough. When you remove a bat from a game because it's altered or be, it became illegal because of that bat, cracked, the cap came off, remove the bat from the dugout, find the side administrator, give it to the side administrator, do not let that bat anywhere near that dugout anymore. That's how we prevent ejections, positive communication. Because if that bat that was altered or the sticker fell off, if it does come back into the game a second time, batter is out. Now we have an ejection. So how do we prevent that ejection? Get it out of the playing area so a mistake isn't made and they grab the wrong bat accidentally. Unsporting behavior. There's a huge rise in NCAA college baseball, NAI baseball, with unsporting behavior. So the rules committee last year really um, made it stricter of what is allowed to congratulate teammates um, after, after a play. So celeb uh, celebratory props. Players can celebrate in the dugout as long as that celebration is not intended and directed at the opponent you could crown a teammate you could give a belt you could give a chain to a teammate in the dugout if props or equipment that are used as props are out of the dugout the person who brought that prop onto the field is ejected no warnings automatic ejection so an example of equipment used as a prop is a bat knighting shoulder to shoulder. 
if that is done on the warning track outside the dugout, the player who is knighted, the player who hit a home run, is ejected. So remind your players, umpires, remind players, keep all props in the dugout. The next one is bat flips and tosses. We're looking for egregious actions of bat flips and tosses. Let's take a look at a video. We have bases loaded, bottom of the fifth inning, down by four, a home run. This player is running with the bat down the line at this moment. This is an egregious act of flipping the bat high into the air. Right, so this is an example of egregious act of flipping the bat. The umpires correctly let this player come around the bases. Home plate umpire is getting the attention of the head coach because the head coach is going to be notified that this player is going to be ejected after he legally scores. So scores the run, and he ejects the hitter properly. All right? He's not over flamboyant over the situation. He is just communicating behavior. This is not a judgment. This is communicating what the player did. An egregious flip of the bat towards the opponent's dugout, automatic ejection. Another reminder as we go back to the PowerPoint. Umpires, players have to remain at the warning track and or in the dugout. The only players that could come to this dirt circle is the on-deck hitter and the runners who were on base. So in this case, the three runners and on-deck hitter, four players could be around home plate. All other players must remain at the warning track or in or near their dugout. So again, good job by this coach backing them up. Good job players staying back. We don't see any celebratory props coming out, but we do have a bat flip, which is egregious automatic ejection. If there is an altercation on the field, a player who goes onto the field is automatic ejected. They cannot leave the dugout during field situations. Coaches can to prevent a fight or to break up a fight. Players cannot. Umpires leaving, then stopping and returning because we as umpires immediately told them to go back to the dugout follows the intent of this rule. So we're not going to be the one foot out ejection staff. We're going to be the one foot out guys remain in the dugout, go back to the dugout. As long as they follow that instruction, it is not an ejection. If they ignore it, stay out of the dugout or keep moving towards that field situation, now we have an ejection. Ball strike judgment situations. Umpires are taught we're not going to be perfect. Coaches are going to disagree with judgment calls. Um, coaches aren't going to always be right on their judgment either. So if it's random, a big play, a big pitch, we're going to understand that emotion and we're going to ignore it. Give the information to the catcher so the catcher could give the information to the coach. If it's continual, that's not inside, that's not inside, that's not low, that's not low, your zone's too small, make your zone bigger. Now we're going to look at the coach. Coach, I heard you. I'm working with your catcher, and the catcher has all the information. If it still continues, now we warn the team. Take off your mask, walk away from the team, write down the time, inning, score, and what was said to earn the warning, and say, Coach, here's your team warning for ball strike, for judgment situations. If anybody on your team continues to argue judgment calls, they're at risk of ejecting themselves. Put on your mask. Put the ball in play. I, I, I can't stress enough. Catchers are your best friends when it comes to preventing this escalation. Communicate with the catchers. It's okay to ask the catchers, hey, catch, would you want that pitch to be called that way against you and your team? They will give you honest feedback. You might have to adjust appropriately as well. And they must adjust appropriately as well too. 
So let's work together, all right, the we instead of the me, to get a flow of the game and understanding of these judgment situations. We've been doing a good job early in the season with bench jockeying. I, I will say as we get later in the season and opponents start seeing each other for second or sometimes third time in a season, there's baggage. Okay, And when there's baggage, now we have bench jockeying. So, coaches, very important. We are teaching our umpires. When in doubt, comments are being made from the dugout. We'll just say towards the field. We are going to err on the side that those comments are directed and intended towards the opponent. If you start hearing comments from your dugout, your team, it is always best as a head coach to shut that down. We will hear that as umpires, and we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt and save the bench jockeying warning. It's like, thank you, coach, for hearing it, for initiating the conversation with your players to keep it on your own team. If that does not happen, or the head coach does do that, but the players don't respond, umpires will have to issue a bench jockeying warning. All right, so some comments, free bases, throw me five, throw me six, give those worms a helmet. All right, there's a lot more of those comments out there, but those are the big ones that are coming on my head right away. They are not directed to their team. When in doubt, we are going to err on the side that those comments are directed to the opponent. Coaches, we want you to control your teams. We don't want to control the teams. We want the coaches to control the teams. If the players don't follow that guidance of the coach, or maybe the coach is busy, don't hear it, and we have a reaction from the opponent, umpires issue the bench jockeying warning. Team, this is your bench jockeying warning. Whoever continues to make comments directed towards the other team is at risk of ejecting themselves. And we are going to err on the side that those comments are directed to the opponents. So avoid those innuendos. Keep comments on your own teammates. And be positive. Find good things for your teammates. Unsporting behavior penalty. We talked about the team warning. After the team warning, if a person or player continues, they are rejected. After that first ejection, a person or player continues, the head coach is also ejected on the third offense. Remember, coaches, if you're ejected because it's the third offense after a warning and the first ejection, you have to serve a one-game suspension when ejected. Umpires are going to complete the NAIA ejection report. They'll put in the time inning and what was done behavior-wise to earn the warning, the time inning score of what behavior was done for the ejection, and if it continues, the second ejection, they'll give a rule reference and they'll put be specific of the behavior witnessed or heard. They'll send it to myself, then they'll file the report in NAIA RefQuest ejection reports, and that report will go to the school, the conference, and myself. 20-second action clock. I believe we're taking strides to get action clocks visible on the field. I, I can't stress enough. If we want to be consistent as a NAIA GPAC conference, I strongly recommend getting visible 20-second clock at all GPAC conferences complexes. It's really the only way we could get towards that 100% compliant and consistent. Now the rule. Start of the half inning, the first batter, that 20-second action clock starts when the plate umpire states play. Base umpire will be responsible for it, either stopwatch or ready ref. Once the inning started, there's a new batter. Offense or defense is throwing the ball around the horn. Right, For the new batter, that 20-second action clock will be when the home plate umpire points at the pitcher. Since the ball's not dead, we don't say play, but you'll see that home, home plate umpire point at the pitcher. You're going to see the base umpire go to their waist or go to their stopwatch to start the 20 seconds. When there's runners on base, 
in between pitches during the batter. That 20 seconds will start when the pitcher has the ball in the dirt circle or if a pitcher catches the ball outside the dirt circle, walks around in the grass, remaining outside the dirt circle to circumvent the rule, once they start walking around the mound, that's when the base umpire is going to start the 20 seconds. All right, so remind your pitchers that you can't circumvent the rule just by staying outside the dirt circle. Normal baseball action, pitcher catches it, walks up the mound. If they're walking around, we are going to start the 20-second uh, pitch clock if pitchers are circumventing the rule. When will we reset it? When pitchers does not make a, a legitimate pickoff attempt, we will reset it once per batter without penalty. So the question is, what if they don't like a sign? Once per batter, pitcher step off, <laughs> ask for a new sign. Umpires are going to give one finger with both hands on the side of the body. That's the reset. Once that pitcher engages once again, boom, point, and we're going to start the 20 seconds. It is okay once in at bat to step off, not make a pickoff, step back on. One reset per batter. When will we not reset it? That's with no runners on base. If there's no runners on base, 20 seconds has started, pitcher steps off, wants a new sign, pitcher steps on, that 20 second action clock continues to run. We're not going to reset it. There's no reset quote unquote with no runners on base the reset is with runners on base if it's the second reset during a bat with a runner on base the umpire will call time he will point to his wrist indicating pitch clock violation he will award one ball to the batter he's going to put the ball in play coaches this is not a play you can leave the dugout to go to respect the foul line or dirt circle to ask questions this is black and white once it's penalized time ball to play that is as fast as it is going to be in a game otherwise if we allow coaches to come out it, it takes away the intent of the rule pace of play all right so umpires remind coaches if they do want to come out and ask a question they can't in between half innings can they yeah ask the question in between half innings but not after the penalty is enforced. An inverted touch of a live ball by batter or umpire. So pitch in the dirt, catcher blocks it, it goes into the batter's foot or the batter accidentally steps on it. Time. Ball is dead in all cases. Return the runners to the base at the time of pitch. Award the ball a strike as it would have been before it hit the batter. So check swing, strike. Block, ball in the dirt, no swing, ball. All right. It takes a judgment away from the umpire. Was it intentional? Was it unintentional? Note, coaches, if it's clear that the batter intentionally kicks it, that is interference. It's the what if, the when in doubt. When in doubt, it's an inadvertent touch. Time, return the runners. Hit by pitch review. All right, we do not have video review in the GPAC conference. We do have crew review and crew consultation in the GPAC conference. So what can the base, base umpires give the home plate umpire? Did the batter go contact the ball, as in stick out the elbow of the chicken wing, or roll the knee into a ball? The base umpire can give that information to the plate umpire. They can give information. Did the ball contact the batter? All right, so it was a high and tight. Was there a change of direction of the baseball? Did the ball hit the dirt and not the batter's foot? If the base umpire has definite knowledge there, they could give that to the plate umpire. So our when in doubt philosophies. When in doubt, did the batter turn into the pitch ball? He did not. We must be 100% sure the batter went to the baseball to enforce either a ball or strike, keep the batter at the box. When in doubt, did the ball hit the batter or not? It did not hit the batter. Again, we need to know a 
pitch ball hit the batter for us to give the penalty of a one base award hit by pitch. All right, so we have to be certain. We have to see what we call here for sure if we're going to use the base umpire's information. So here is a picture of where coaches can go for the coach umpire conference. All right, so if there's a play at home, coaches, you must remain outside the dirt circle in foul territory. Once you get there, the home plate umpire will uh, recognize the situation and they will meet you. If it's a base umpire call, say force play slide rule at second base, a tag play at second base, uh, was it a catch or no catch? It's in the outfield. Umpire or head coaches, go to your respective fair foul lines. So if you're a third base coach, you're going to come down here. If you're in a third base, you're going to come to this X. If you're first base, you're going to come to this X. Once you get to that spot, if it's the fair foul line spot, we know it's the base umpire call. If it's around the dirt circle, outside the dirt circle, we know you want to talk to the home plate umpire. That is where that coach umpire conference is going to take place. Umpires are going to listen to your perspective. They're going to listen to your question. And then they're going to do one of two things. They're going to say, in my judgment, this is what I saw. So by rule, this is the result of the play. Or they're going to say, coach, what I'm going to do is once you go back to the dugout, I'm going to meet with my partner and we're going to discuss the situation. I'm going to give them what I saw. I'm going to give them your perspective. I'm going to ask what, they're, what they saw. Whatever comes out of that crew consultation, that's what we're going to go with. When that happens, coaches who were originally out of the dugout for this umpire coach conference cannot come back out a second time. If the call is changed, the opposing coach could come out of the dugout to the respective foul line and or the dirt circle to ask what was the call, what was given by the other coach, why was the, the call changed. We have to have that information for the opposing coach. They can come out one time. That's the main thing. We are allowing coaches to come out one time to give information, receive information both ways. Awkward play. But this is a rule of clarification, doesn't come up too often. The main thing is all runners advance one base. So if there is a player stealing home and that pitch hits that runner, the ball is dead immediately. We score the run as so long as that runner touch home plate. We call the pitch a ball or strike had that pitch not hit the runner and all other runners advance one base without at risk of being put out. Designated hitter rule, DH must hit once. So if you have a nine-player lineup, pitcher DH. If that pitcher gives up eight runs in the top of the first inning, they must remain in the game as a pitcher DH and hit in the bottom of the first inning or second inning, depending on where they're at in the lineup. That DH must hit once. If they don't, now we have an improper batter rule, and that will be an automatic out, then the next proper batter up. Once that DH hits once, later in the game, a team loses a DH in two situations. Pitcher DH moves to a defensive position, such as we said earlier, shortstop. Once that pitcher DH moves to shortstop, DH is gone. If a defensive player comes into pitch, as in third, short, second, first, right, center, catcher, left field, if they come into pitch, now that DH is gone. Can that player stay in the game? Yes. They go play a position, and all players stay in the same exact batting order position. When does the DH remain? The pitcher DH is substituted for an eligible substitute. All right, so we go from a nine-player lineup to a ten-player lineup. So I start pitch, and I DH, I hit for myself. Seventh inning, number 27 comes in game to pitch, but I am now a DH. An eligible substitute came in the pitch. I am now only a DH. If the DH comes into a game as a pitcher DH, so we start 10 player. All right, so 
I number 10 am hitting for the pitcher number 27. Seventh inning, me number 10 come into the game to pitch. So we started with 10. It is now a nine player lineup. Force play slide rule. When in doubt, it is an illegal slide in NAIA baseball. This is a safety rule. There is a rule interpretation. Umpires can use judgment of no interference on a quote unquote illegal slide due to the nature of play and the nature of the play and the nature of the illegal slide. Nobody was at risk of being injured. So we have an unbelievable diving play by the shortstop. Runner on first thinks it's going to be an easy hit up the middle. Now, all of a sudden, that shortstop is throwing it over their shoulder. The second baseman is reaching for that ball just like a first baseman would. That's not a double play. And that R1 runner at first base does a roll slide and keeps his hand on the base. Since that second baseman was never at risk of being injured, that runner changed because the shortstop made an unbelievable play. That's an illegal slide, but nobody's at risk. No force play slide rule. Coaches, players watching this video, to avoid our judgment of illegal slide, always slide with your buttocks or chest on the ground straight to and through the base within normal distance of a slide. So a late slide is going to be deemed as illegal slide. Let's take a look at a couple plays here. Runner on first base, ground ball up the middle. We have that right hand up and a pop-up slide. This is illegal. Multiple reasons. This runner is outside of second base. He is not sliding straight to second base. Second reason, this right hand is high up in the air, causing the double clutch in the umpire's judgment of releasing the ball. Obviously, a coach is going to say, well, they double clutch because they didn't have control of the baseball. But that's not the philosophy of umpires. We err on the side of an illegal force play slide rule because it's a safety play. So since this runner is not sliding straight to and through, this much of the bag is open. We have a high right hand causing the double clutch. This is a force play slide rule. By philosophy, we are erring on an illegal slide. So correctly called force play slide rule. Runner is out. Ball is dead. This batter runner is automatically out. Play number two. Runner on first base again, four sets second. This is what we call a roll slide. So this is not a legal slide on the chest or buttocks. You actually have the runner rolling and ending up on the side of their body, not sliding straight to and through the base. This is illegal force play slide rule. That runner is out and the runner, batter runner going to first base is out automatically ball is dead this is a good play to remind players force play slide rule is at home as well okay does a runner have to slide no all right but if they don't slide they're at risk of a potential judgment all right there was no intent here whatsoever for this catcher to do a double play. This is an unusual situation, all right? So because this catcher only has one out, this runner is not attempting to break up a double play. This runner is not making an opponent potential for injury or is at risk. So this is a play that is unnatural, unusual. This is not force play slide rule and that runner shall not be deemed out as so long as number five touch home plate. Since the catcher did not retain possession of the ball in the tag, we would have safe. So a reminder on this one. This is an unusual play. Runners are not forced to slide, but if they don't slide, 
they got to avoid contact and they cannot put up an opponent at risk of injury, which is exactly what we have here. Correctly ruled, not force play slide rule. Here's play number four. We have a slide towards the fielder, not straight to and through the base. This would be correctly ruled. Force play slide rule. This runner is out, and also the batter runner is out automatically as a penalty. So good examples here for us to learn from of coaches, players watching this to avoid the err in judgment. Slide with your buttock straight on the ground or chest on the ground, natural position away from the base. Slide straight to and through the base or away from the fielder to prevent injury. Next one, runner interfering with the foul ball. Less than two outs, runner is out, batter is called for strike, and that batter continues to bat. So this is a fly ball that drops and is a foul ball. That runner is out for interference. You award a strike to that batter, now it's a one-two count. With two outs, fly ball, runner on third, interferes with the third baseman, ball drops, that runner on third is out, that same batter will lead off the next inning with a new count, OO count. Umpires prevent batting out of order here. In th if this situation comes up and it is the third out of the inning, as that coach is coming to the dugout, remind them, number 13 is going to be the first batter to lead off next inning. Positive communication preventing a bad situation from happening. Runner pushed off the base, 8-5-1. Intentionally or unintentionally, if the runner would have remained on the base without contact, it shall be judged pushed off. So pushed off doesn't mean a two-hand shove. I take him off the base. When in doubt, umpires, the contact forced the runner off the base. Let's take a look at a video. We have this fielder tagging. The runner going to third base, that runner is out. His momentum carries him into the base. Intentionally or unintentionally, that player momentum takes this runner off the base. If we deem that contact to take this runner off the base who's on third base, we shall not have this runner be called out. It's a judgment call, not a replay call. It's a judgment call. And when in doubt, we want to err on the side of safety that this runner on third base would have remained on third base had he not been forced off by this player. Pitcher going to the mouth. So this is a really a rule interpretation that is misinterpreted quite a bit. When a pitcher is out of the dirt circle, a pitcher can go to their mouth and could actually go to the baseball. Um, they, now, they can't spit on it. They can't put pine tar or rosin on it. Uh, but they could go to the mouth, rub, rub down the baseball. There's no penalty. In the dirt circle, they must wipe off the hand or fingers that went to the mouth before going to the baseball. If they don't do that, the umpires are going to call time. They're going to go to the mound, switch baseballs. They're going to warn the pitcher. When you go to your mouth, wipe it off before going to the ball in the dirt circle. If that pitcher is engaged, so this is not engaged. This is straddling. This is where we would give a warning. If this pivot foot is engaged with the rubber, they go to their mouth, go straight to the ball. There is no warning. It is automatic. B-A-L-L, -L, ball. It's a ball because it's in a disadvantage to the hitter. It's not a disadvantage to the runner. It is never a balk going to the mouth to the ball. If we're going to penalize, it's a ball the first time when engaged with the rubber, 
It's a ball after a warning if the pitcher's doing it, not engaged with the rubber. Replay situations. As stated before, we do not have video replay in the G-Pack, but we have crew replay in the G-Pack. If the base umpire calls a home run and the base umpire has knowledge that it bounced over the fence, we can change that call to ground rule double. If a foul tip is dropped by the catcher, but the base umpire has a foul tip going directly into the catcher's glove before hitting the dirt, we could give that information to change the call. Catcher no catch in foul territory anywhere or in the outfield. If a catch called by the base umpire is turned into a no catch by the ba home plate umpire, the batter gets first base, all other runners one base. No catch by the plate umpire turned into a catch by the base umpire. Return runners and we can advance runner if warranted. Example, if there's a runner on third base and we have no catch, that runner on third base scores because the umpire said no catch. We get together as a crew, we come out catch. Common sense, baseball knowledge. We have a warning track play, we have a runner on third base. If we called cr catch correctly in the play, that runner would illegally tagged and scored. So that's a, that, that's a case where we could warrant advancing that runner a base. Err in judgment when the ball is juggled, dropped, or bobbled on a force play or tag play. We have too quick of a timing. Home plate umpire calls out at home. Base umpire sees the catcher pick up the ball to show the, the plate umpire. Time, get together, share information. Fair or foul beyond first or third baseman. All right, so that first baseman, third baseman dive and block the home plate umpire's vision of that fair foul ball. The base umpire sees the ball hit the fair line or hit outside the fair foul line. We can get together and properly place runners. <coughs> if it was first called foul and it was a fair ball and it was a fair ball down the line, we might want to be conservative. Don't give a triple automatically. But if it was going to be a stand-up double, give that batter runner a double. Spectator interference, and another play is a balk. Plate umpire calls a balk. Base umpire knows the pitcher disengaged before that balking action. Time. Share information. Pitcher disengaged became a fielder. They now can fake a throw to first base. Um, we will have a reset, but we could avoid that balk situation with the review. The last part of this preseason staff meeting video is going to be on our accountability of strike zone. Our national standard strike zone. One ball off the plate is acceptable. And what we mean by one ball, any part of the ball touching the strike zone, we need to call a strike. We cannot miss any part of the ball touching this official strike zone. Coaches. Notice how high this strike zone is. Yes, that ball can be touching the elbow. That is a strike. Umpires, we do not call enough high pitch strikes that touch the actual official strike zone. A lot of tips to use. Where is that batter's elbow? Where is that catcher's mask compared to the catcher's or batter's elbow? Every at-bat, every catcher stance is different, but use it as reference points to get these high pitches. Coaches, if you have umpires correctly calling this high zone, any part of the ball that touches this top part of the zone over the plate is a strike. Now, what is acceptable outside of this strike zone? If the center of the baseball hits this buffer zone as long as we're consistent as a plate umpire this is a strike all right so we have 17 inches we have the any part of the ball which is two and a quarter inches we have another two inches off the plate any part of the ball center of the ball in this buffer zone 
can be deemed a strike. So umpires, when it comes to the batter's box lines, if that ball touches the batter's box line, any part of the ball touches the batter's box line, it's a ball. We can't call that a strike. So don't widen your strike zone. Where you could have a bigger strike zone, by rule and by buffer zone, we miss this top portion of the zone. Okay, so call the high strike by rule. Final notes for the GPAC preseason meeting. We will have our next training video where we're going to focus on mechanics. Coaches, we encourage you to watch the next training video as well over mechanics so you understand where the umpires are standing and why they're standing there. And if you do have a question, you know which umpire to go out to to question a judgment, an appeal. Umpires, make sure you register with the NAIA. I'm going to be up, uh, checking our roster March 1st. There is no NAIA video, but once you register with NAIA, there's NCAA video. Watch the preseason NCAA video. The NAIA test is out. I believe 18 of them are on the, are on the rule modifications for NAIA baseball. Really focus on those rule modifications. Update availability in arbitersports.com. Coaches, log into arbitersports.com. Confirm the schedule that is in there is correct. Date, time, location. If something is incorrect, contact me as soon as you possibly can because as small of a change from 3 o'clock in the afternoon first pitch to 1 o'clock in the afternoon first pitch is a huge difference to umpires. 3 o'clock umpires could take a half day of work. 1 o'clock, they got to take a full day of work off. That makes a difference. Don't wait. New umpires get Arbiter Pay set up so the schools can pay you on the 1st and 15th of each month. And get in the rule book, stay in the rule book, challenge yourself. Read one case play a day. Have conversations with your partners pregame on rule situations, communication situations, judgments, thresholds. Let's Keep on getting better as a whole we team in the GPAC. We versus me. Thank you for watching the training tape. Any questions, please reach out to myself, cell phone, or email. Have a great season and good luck and safe health and travels to everybody involved.